The Lord be with you. A reading from the conclusion of the Holy Gospel according to John. Peter turned and saw the disciple following whom Jesus loved, the one who had also reclined upon his chest during the supper, and had said, Master, who is the one who will betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about him? Jesus said to him, What if I want him to remain until I come? What concern is it of yours? You follow me. So the word spread among the, other, the brothers that the disciple would not die. But Jesus had not told him that he would not die. Just what if I want him to remain until I come? What concern is it of yours? It is this disciple who testifies to these things and has written them. And we know that his testimony is true. There are also many other things that Jesus did. But if these were to be described individually, I do not think the whole world would contain the books that would be written. The Gospel of the Lord. As we come to the close of our Novena to St. Peregrine, let us say together our Novena prayer. O great St. Peregrine, you have been called the wonder worker because of the numerous miracles which you have obtained from God for those who have had recourse to you. For so many years you bore in your own flesh the debilitating disease of cancer. I seek God's healing. Help me to imitate your enduring faith in the face of my great challenge, that I may trust the Lord as you did in your time of affliction. Help me to find the strength to proclaim God's presence in my life, despite the anguish and fear this disease causes in me and my loved ones. O glorious St. Peregrine, aided in this way by your powerful intercession, I will sing to God now and for all eternity a song of gratitude for his great goodness and mercy. Amen. Well, was Jesus touched by the sickness and death of those closest to him? We know that he was. One of the reasons is he wept for his friend Lazarus. Very few occasions in the New Testament does Jesus weep once of Jerusalem. But here for a person, a friend. And if you look at chapter 11 of St. John's Gospel, you can see how Jesus, the light of the world, comes to a human tomb, the tomb of Lazarus and by the power of his word, breaks open the sealed tomb to call Lazarus out. So the light falls upon the tomb from Christ. Lazarus, whom he loved, he called him back to life. Now in the story of the raising of Lazarus, and for Lazarus, read me. We will see all of the attitudes and experiences that human beings bring to their confrontation with death. We are the only creatures who know that we will die. Only the manner of it is hidden from us in God's providence. So when Jesus comes face to face with the grieving Martha and Mary, when he stops short in front of the door to Lazarus' tomb, sealed by a heavy stone, we see in a clear way all of the darkest fears and doubts that threaten to undermine or make us question our commitment to follow the Lord, the Good Shepherd, wherever he may lead us. Only when the light of the world has shone into the darkness and the recesses of our fears and anxieties and darkness, and that darkness has not overcome it, will we be empowered to witness courageously to the good news of Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life. The story of the raising of Lazarus is divided into seven seasons and opened with a statement that Lazarus lies ill. His sisters take the trouble to send a message to Jesus telling him. So the presence of Jesus is important. So for the very beginning, Lazarus' restoration to life is linked to Jesus losing his. There's to be an exchange. When he hears the news, Jesus is on the far side of the Jordan. He is in a safe place. So he has to cross the river, the river in which John baptized, to come from this far country to minister to his friend. And even though he loves this family, they're his special friends, he delays two days before going. So Bethany is the place of threat. It's close to Jerusalem, a city which is hostile to Jesus. 
So Jesus is like the man from the far country who draws near to us, not for his sake, not for his need, but for ours. And the danger and the threat implicit in this journey is made clear by Thomas. Let us go and die with him. Now Jesus says this sickness is not unto death, it's for the glory of God. And that's a very ambiguous statement. It's not literally true because Lazarus does die. And it's unto death in another way too, since Jesus will set in motion the events leading to his own death. But in another sense, John is telling us, it's not unto death, because Lazarus will be brought back to ordinary human life. But Jesus will rise to a new order of existence. Now Jesus stayed two days. Lazarus dies, yet Jesus stays. How is this compatible with love? When we hear of the illness of a, young, of a loved one, serious illness, grave illness, danger of death, what do we do? We depart at once. Jesus did not. And that's just the question that Martha, Martha focuses on when she says accusingly, when he arrives, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Your absence caused his death. Well, central to all of this is the notion that God loves people, but he also lets them die, which is something we find difficult to understand. Jesus often delays before forming, performing a sign. Because human agendas, human needs, do not control John's Jesus. He is supremely free. He has his own divine timetable and will not be imprisoned by any other that we care to impose on him. Now, giving in to human demands promotes an inferior form of faith, one which is wrapped up in its own needs, one that is in danger of not seeing life-giving revelation. So true faith must wait and come to recognize the divine agenda to which Jesus responds. But Jesus then goes on to say that since his hour is not yet come, he may safely go to Judea. Now, as far as Jesus is concerned, Lazarus is asleep, even though he's dead. Sleep, of course, was a common metaphor for death in early Christian communities. So Jesus can then talk about going to wake Lazarus. So the disciples misunderstand again. They think that he will recover. They've not seen the ambiguity of the language of sleep and waking. So Jesus has to make the point plainly. Lazarus is dead. So basically the problems being addressed are the questions the early church had about death. When will the Lord come? How much sense does it make, make to say Jesus has destroyed death if people still insist on doing it? It's in this connection that Jesus expresses satisfaction that he was not there at Lazarus' death because the death of Lazarus will be the opportunity for the disciples to believe. Now the scene then shifts to Bethany where John stresses that Jesus finds that Lazarus has been in the tomb four days. He uses that word. Jesus finds Lazarus' tomb full. His corpse is in it. But the women and the disciples are to find Jesus' tomb empty. So St. John is taking, setting up a contrast between the two tombs. He's also making sure that we realize that Lazarus is well and truly dead. Now the belief of the time was that the soul of the dead person hung about the tomb for some time after death. But by the fourth day, the features of the dead person were no longer recognizable. This was a sign then that the soul had left the body to the Jewish people. So if Lazarus is four days dead, then a stupendous miracle will be required to raise him. A miracle going beyond any other biblical raising. Now the central theological point of the story is the encounter with Martha. Martha. Again, there's a contrast between the two sisters. Martha comes out at once. Mary remains in her grieving posture in the house. Martha is disappointed and says so directly. It's even a rebuke. And we know that Jesus' delay has been deliberate. Maybe she knows this by this time. But she still expresses something of a faithful attitude. She believes that Jesus could have presented this death if you had been there. You could have prevented it by your presence. But can you heal it now or has he gone beyond all of your gracious power? Now her faith is partial because she has no idea that he can heal it. So she shows the same attitude that many feel in the face of death and in the grip of bereavement. A sense of hopelessness and deep loss combined with a sense of the absence of God even may be tinged with anger. 
And the word of revelation then comes in the shape of an I am saying. Jesus uses those words communicated to Moses on Mount Sinai. I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus is the personal communication of the resurrection life. He can communicate that benefit here and now. Now this changes Martha's perspective entirely. It gives her more than she can dream of. Lazarus becomes a symbol of the gift that Jesus brings to all. What Jesus is for Lazarus, he can do for all who die. So Lazarus is not simply to be restored to ordinary human biological life, but to a share in eternal life. Those who are alive in faith don't face death in any ultimate sense. They live towards eternal life, provided they can make the act of faith which our dying is. So Martha believes this and fills out her testimony of faith by confessing Jesus is the Christ, he is the Messiah. And it's then, once she has confessed her faith, that Jesus moves towards the tomb. Now when he approaches the tomb, John uses an interesting phrase. He tells us he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. This is usually associated with grief. So there's a strong element of grief present in his reaction. John tells us, I mean the implication of the phrase is that he made a kind of sound that's often made in anger. It's used elsewhere to describe the snort of a horse. So the word occurs in two other places in John. And the reference in both places is to Jesus' emotional reaction at the prospect of death. So in looking at the door of the tomb, he's looking at his own death. It's the prospect of his own death. And this causes a mixture of grief and anger to him. So before Lazarus' tomb, he has two conflicting emotions. Empathy for Lazarus and distress for his own plight. John tells us of the intensity of Jesus' feeling for Lazarus by using a different word to describe Jesus' grief to the one he uses for the grief of Martha and Mary. It's a more intense feeling of sorrow. Jesus knows that performing the miracle will set in motion the forces which will lead to his death. So he now faces a conflict with the powers of darkness that have been implicit all the way through his ministry. We are being told by John of the cost to Jesus of all that will follow from the performance of this sign, the raising to life of Lazarus. So Jesus gives life to one he loves by taking steps that will clearly cost him his own life. John is telling us of costly grace. It doesn't come cheap. And he then goes on to describe the tomb in such a way as to compare it to the tomb that Jesus will soon be laid in. Jesus orders, take away the stone. Well, that's a terrible command because corruption and contamination are associated with death for the Jews. So he's gone to the very limit, to the frontier of life and death, and he's now going beyond. But the stone is removed at his powerful command. Now at his tomb, Mary Magdalene will find the stone already mysteriously removed. Martha says, Lord, he will stink. Removing the stone then is an act of faith. He is beyond all human help. But at his word, they do it. And Jesus prays to the Father before the miracle. It's a thanksgiving prayer, a kind of Eucharistic prayer. And he shows that his whole life and ministry is the working out of his life-giving mission from the Father while praying for the faith of the bystanders, not all of whom will understand it and some of whom will use it as a way of bringing him to the cross. He then shouts, Come forth. And Lazarus heeds Jesus' cry, bound as he is by the wrappings of death. Again, you have to contrast Jesus' tomb wrappings, which are neatly rolled up and lying in the tomb, according to John. And when Peter saw Jesus' wrappings, he believed. A neatly folded shroud and separate napkin for the head made him believe. So Jesus resumes his life actively and majestically and freely. Jesus, who lays down his life, can take it up again. But Lazarus is passive in his resurrection. He needs to be loosed from his bonds. We all need to be loosed from our bonds. Jesus takes his life back. Lazarus receives him. Now, the bystanders show two reactions. 
Many believe. They show faith that follows signs. Inadequate faith. Some tell the Pharisees what Jesus has done and set in motion the plot against him. So the Lazarus story gives us the key to our Christian journey, the faith journey, the Christian exodus. It shows us that our life comes to us at the cost of his. It's a parable for the entire action of the gospel, for the entire baptismal story. Jesus left the safe country beyond the Jordan to enter the dangerous territory to give life to a friend at the point of death. That sums up the entire movement of the fourth gospel. The word who is God leaves the safe country, the space of heaven where he enjoys communion with the Father in the unity of the Holy Spirit to come to the world which God so loves but which is at the point of death because it has turned away from life. He comes then to raise the one whom he loved, all of us. Now Jesus also weeps. He doesn't keen and wail and mourn like the Jews and Mary do in their slender faith. He weeps with and for this grieving family. He assures us that there is a compatibility between faith and human sorrow. Lazarus' resurrection is not a temporary remedy to a grieving family, but is a symbol of eternal life, which is communicated to all believers. Now, Jesus' revelation, self-revelation, means, meets different responses in terms of faith. There's always, in John's Gospel, a group of spectators who do not come to faith. The opponents of Jesus are afraid of their loss of power. And in the face of this, Jesus, the life-giver, has to die. He's condemned to die because the giving of life threatens, challenges, and dethrones the power structures of this world. Jesus' death is caused by those who prefer darkness. And the cost continues in those who, like Lazarus, are brought to life by Jesus. It continues in us. Well, the forces of death can't tolerate the living witnesses of life. Lazarus is a representative figure. Lazarus is me. At the cost of his own life, Jesus has come to communicate eternal life to me. I am he whom he loves. For me, Jesus wept. Before my tomb, he wrestled with the cost of love so that I might be called forth into life. So God is not indifferent to death and grief. In Jesus, God becomes vulnerable physically, and might we dare to say even psychologically, to death. And at the deepest level, the story invites us to believe in God as the one who gives life in death and out of death. The God who says to us, Did I not tell you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? So let us pray then our prayer to St. Jude. St. Jude, glorious apostle, faithful servant and friend of Jesus, the name of the traitor has caused you to be forgotten by many, but the Church honors and invokes you universally as the patron of difficult and desperate cases. Pray for me who am in need of God's mercy. Make use, I implore you, of that particular privilege accorded to you to bring visible and speedy help where help was almost despaired of. Come to my assistance in this great need, that I may receive the consolation and help of heaven in all my necessities, tribulations and sufferings, particularly. And that I may praise God with you and all the elect throughout all eternity. I promise you, O blessed Jude, to be ever mindful of this great favor. I will honor you as my special and powerful patron and encourage devotion to you. St. Jude, pray for us and for all who honor and invoke thy aid. Amen.